Good morning. Today is an exciting day because after we talk about the new habitat we're going to look at today, we are going to plant our seeds. So stay tuned for that one at the end of our video. What have we learned about thus far about freshwater habitat? We talked about it yesterday. Why is it called freshwater? You're right, because there's no salt in it. What are some of the plants that live in freshwater habitat? We learned about cattails and water lilies. And what are some of the animals that live there? You guessed it. We talked about frogs, ducks, and fish. Now we're going to learn about a different type of water habitat called a saltwater habitat. Remember, we already learned about one type of saltwater habitat when we learned about the Arctic Ocean habitat. That was a saltwater habitat. For many years, only four oceans were recognized. The Arctic, Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian. All saltwater habitats. Some years ago, however, the Southern Ocean, which lies along the coastline of Antarctica, was designated as the fifth ocean. The one thing all saltwater habitats have in common is that the water is salty. Listen carefully to find out more about oceans and saltwater habitats. Welcome to the last habitat we're going to explore. In the last read aloud, we explored freshwater habitats. Now we're going to learn about another kind of water habitat, a saltwater habitat. Saltwater habitats, as you could guess from their name, contain lots of salt. This means that we can't use salt water for drinking. Would you like to drink a cup of salty water? No, thanks. It's hard to imagine, but more of the earth is covered in water than is covered with land. Most of that water is salt water in oceans and seas. Oceans are huge areas of salt water that stretch all around our planet. And they are home to almost half of the world's species of animals and millions of different plants. The water in the ocean comes from rain, as well as from rivers and streams that flow into the ocean. Seas are smaller areas of salt water that have land around them or around part of them. I've come to the largest ocean, the Pacific, to show you a bit more about ocean habitats and the plants and animals that live in them. I'm standing on a beach looking out at the water. You can see that the waves are crashing onto the beach. This beach and any land that runs alongside the ocean is called the coastline or shoreline. Now, you may think that when you are standing on the land looking at the water, that the land stops where the water starts. It certainly looks that way. But let me get my trusty scuba gear out and walk into the water. Now that I'm in here, I'm still standing on land. It's just that the land is under the water. The land slopes downward the further I go out into the water, which means the water is getting deeper and deeper. The interesting thing about the ocean floor, which is the land under the ocean water, is that it isn't flat. As on land, the earth beneath the ocean waters has both mountains and valleys. This makes some areas of water in the ocean deeper than others. Mountains are areas of land that are very high where the land peaks, and valleys are areas of land that are very low that are in between two high areas, such as mountains. The Pacific Ocean is full of both plant and animal life, but not all of them share the same space. The conditions under the water are very different in various places. Some parts are deep, and some are shallow. Shallow is the antonym or the opposite of the word deep. In other words, not deep. There are cool parts and there are warm parts. Some are dark and some are full of light. Our plants and animals in nearly every part of the ocean, some in the deep, open waters far from the land, and some in the shallow waters close to the shore. Some animals, like turtles, jellyfish, and crabs, live closer to the shore, where it's shallower and warmer. Some animals like it better near the surface of the water, and others prefer to live down at the very bottom of the ocean and on the deep ocean floor. They have all had to adapt to the conditions of their habitats. For instance, the animals that live in the deeper part of the ocean have had to adapt to total darkness, 
because the sun's light just can't reach that deep. Some fish, like the devilfish, have very large mouths and sharp teeth so that they can catch their prey as easily as possible. Other sea creatures have feelers on their bodies that help them feel where their food is. And some animals make their own lights with special chemicals in their bodies, like when you carry a flashlight in the dark. I have now arrived at a special part of the saltwater habitat called a coral reef, which is made up of many tiny animals called corals. Corals stay in one place all their adult lives. They have stomachs and mouths and even skeletons. These skeletons can be on the inside or outside of the coral animals and are also called coral. When the coral animal dies, its skeleton remains in place and other coral animals will come and live on top of the old skeletons. The colony in which the coral lives is called a coral reef. So the coral reef has both coral animals and the skeletons of those animals. I am here in the Pacific Ocean at a coral reef. In addition to the coral, there are many other kinds of animals around a reef. I have found everything from fish and shellfish to octopi and sharks to snails and turtles. Octopi is the plural of octopus. One octopus, but many octopi. Here is an animal that lies in and around this coral reef and whose name most of you can probably guess based on its shape. It's a starfish. This starfish, also known as a sea star, has, has five arms, which make it look like a star. Although it's called a starfish, it's not actually a fish. It belongs to a group of animals that have a spiny skin all over their bodies. If I touch the starfish, I can feel that its body is covered with tiny heart bumps that help protect it from predators such as sharks, manta rays, and other fish. Starfish are also able to protect themselves in another amazing way. If another animal actually catches and bites off one of the starfish's arms, the starfish will not die, and it can still escape. In time, a new arm will grow back to replace the missing arm. When an animal regrows a missing body part, it's called regeneration. What's that word? Regeneration. You got it. The starfish doesn't swim. It crawls very slowly along the ocean floor using hundreds of tiny tube feet. These feet attach to whatever the starfish is crawling over. As it crawls along the floor, the starfish is always on the lookout for food. This starfish's prey includes fish, snails, clams, oysters, and crabs. Here is another animal that lives in salt water. This shellfish is called a lobster. Lobsters live on the ocean floor in openings between rocks. Their hard shell stops most other animals from trying to eat them. Lobsters have many legs that they use for crawling about, and they use antenna on their head to feel their way along the murky ocean floor. I have to watch out for that lobster's claws. They are called pinchers, and they are very strong. The lobster uses them to defend itself against its prey and to catch and crush its own food. Lobsters are carnivores. They eat fish, worms, and other shellfish. I'm going to move out of the way of this lobster before I get squeezed. Looks like I moved right into the path of another predator. This is a hammerhead shark. If you take a look, you can see how the hammerhead got its name. Its head is very thick, and it looks like a hammer from above with an eye and a nostril on each end. The hammerhead shark is a large fish, growing up to 20 feet long and weighing over 500 pounds. That's about the same weight as 10 first graders. Hammerheads like to live in warm waters, so they are mostly found near the coast where the waters are shallow and warmer. Sharks are carnivores. The hammerhead's favorite food is a fish called a ray, but it also likes to eat octopus, lobster, crab, and fish, including other sharks. Most sharks have smooth and slender bodies, which help them to swim fast. Their mouths are full of sharp teeth to help them catch their prey. Let's go back up to the surface. There's a sea animal I'm sure you'll want to see, but we have to travel further out to sea, away from the coral reef and into the deeper water to see it. This amazing creature is the biggest animal in the world. It's a blue whale! 
Blue whales have blue-gray skin and are covered in a layer of blubber that helps keep them warm in the frigid ocean depths. Blue whales are so big that they can weigh as much as 25 elephants. In fact, blue whales are the biggest animals known to have lived on Earth, even bigger than dinosaurs. Do you remember what a blubber was? A layer of fat that keeps the animal warm. You got it. The blue whale spends all of its time living in deep water. But unlike fish, it can't breathe underwater because it does not have gills. It needs to breathe air just like we do. The blue whale can hold its breath and stay under the water for as long as 30 minutes before eventually coming up for air. It breathes using blowholes on top of its head. Sometimes when it does come up for air, it breathes out a huge fountain of water from the blowholes. Blue whales are carnivores. They eat lots of food to build up their blubber during the summer months when food is easy to find. Blue whales eat teeny tiny sea creatures called plankton. The plankton that blue whales eat are small shrimp like shellfish that are about the size of your little finger. It's incredible to think that the biggest animal on earth eats one of the smallest animals on earth. The ocean is so huge and deep that we could spend all year looking at the plants and animals that live there and still not see them all. In fact, there are still many living things in the ocean that people and adventurous rats have not even discovered yet. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the animals in this hot water habitat in the Pacific Ocean. We still have one more stop to make on our worldwide tour of habitats. I'll see you next time. The end. Today is an exciting day because we are going to try planting our seeds again. So I emptied these up um, and took out the lima beans that did not sprout and put fresh new dirt on both containers. I'm going to go ahead and label them and write down sample A on one of them. I'll just write the letter A for sample A and B for sample B. And remember, A is going to be the one that I'm going to give water to, and B is the one that's not going to get any water. Hopefully, these are going to sprout. The box did say guaranteed to sprout in seven days, so hopefully we will see results this time around. I'm going to go ahead and take out my seeds. Now, all of you got the same seeds in a Ziploc bag. I'm going to dump it on my table. Okay, and all you need to do is you need to separate them in half. You can do that with your finger or with a pencil because we're going to put some in the container that has that gets no water and some in the container that does get water. So let's try to make that as equal as possible. A little bit more on this side. Doesn't have to be exact, that's good enough. So what I'm going to do, it says, is to take the seeds and sprinkle them on top of your dirt so we don't have to dig any holes. So I'm just going to take some in my hand and I'm going to sprinkle them on top. I'm just moving my hand around so you can kind of see what I'm doing. I'm sliding it off the table into my hand so it's easier for me to sprinkle it. So they're all in my hand. I'm just going to take it and sprinkle it. I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Okay, so both sides got seed, both sides got dirt. So we're making sure our variables are the same. They're in the same kind of container. And now we're going to add water. The only variable that I'm changing is water. So I'm going to add water to container A. It's said to put three tablespoons of water, so I'm going to measure and add three tablespoons of water. Here's one. Here's two. And three, I hope it's not too much. The soil was kind of damp since it's been raining outside, but I'm gonna put in my three. 
and sample B gets no water. Now it's asking us to cover them, cover both of them. Since I don't have caps for um, containers, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sheet of construction paper and I'm going to cut a square so I can just kind of put it right on top. And I'm going to cut this in half. That should be enough to kind of cover both of them. And we're going to cover both of them and put them in direct sunlight. So I'm going to go downstairs and put these next to a window sill. And we're going to leave these covered for the next 48 hours. Since today is Tuesday and you're planting and covering your seeds Tuesday, until Thursday this time, we're not going to uncover our cups. Hopefully when we remove these lids, we should see little sprouts popping out. If you don't have um, paper, you can also cover them with aluminum foil. You can cover them with a small plate, whatever you want. As long as they're covered, it's okay. Just remember whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other side to make sure that the variables are the same. All right, I'm gonna take these downstairs now. And here they are in my windowsill. Hopefully these are going to germinate soon. And before I forget, I should tell you what kind of seeds that we planted. These are called microgreen seeds. It says, a powerful and flavorful combination of broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, and cabbage microgreens. So, sounds yummy and delicious. Hopefully it works. See you next time. Bye.